Thanks. Okay, yay. So, you know, Debbie always says, you guys don't seem excited. What should I do to you? Should I make you move? You're so quiet. I promise at four in the morning when I get up, I'm going to ask her those questions. <laughs> right? Tomorrow morning, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention all those things. And if I live through it, I'll let you know how it goes. So, doesn't that seem just? Some of you are like, yeah, do it, do it. Which means you're probably vindictive, but it's okay. Uh, so, I want to talk today about learning not to follow the world's pattern of religion. And, uh, you know, that's, we, don't, we don't always talk in those terms. But there, there are a lot of religions in the world and, uh, and there are a lot of philosophies in the world about religion in this world. And unfortunately, there's, there's a great deal of blend between philosophies and religions in this world. Have you noticed? And, but, but are we aware of the importance of not following those culture patterns? That, that, you know, when you, when you talk to people that are in the know about such things, that Christianity is in, was always intended by God to be what's called counterculture. And, and that's very important in this world. And I'm not just talking about, you know, being, you know, the old movie Rebel Without a Cause. What are you rebelling against? What do you got? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that, it, you know, from the, when you read the Gospels, Every time the Lord talked about, he'll, he'd say the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God uh, is, and he'd, he'd make that statement, the kingdom of God is, he would describe something that was completely contrary, not only to the culture of the day, but also to the religious culture of the day. And, and, and we see all those paradoxes in scripture. And, 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 you know, like you give up to gain and, and you humble yourself to be exalted and, and you, uh, you die to live. And he was always describing things that seemed different and counterculture. And throughout the history of the church, as we, if we were to take time to look at that, we would see that there, are, there have always been aspects of the church that are counterculture. And I was thinking about that, uh, well, this week in the midweek uh, discussion, I was talking about uh, common grace and morality. And um, what we can note about that is uh, there's a common grace from God that causes mankind, who even people who don't believe in him, to, re to have some moral restraint. Now, some of you are saying, well, where's that right now? It's still there. Imagine what it would be like if it wasn't. And, and so as we begin to think in those terms, wherever throughout, throughout the world, when we study uh, history and sociology and, and we, we begin to look at that throughout the world, one thing we begin to notice is that every culture that has remained, that, that remained to the great extent untouched by the gospel is those cultures tend to be the cultures without, without mores in a society. And, and we could use an example, you know, a cannibalistic culture. As a cannibalistic culture stays cannibalistic and doesn't value human life as it should because it's untouched by the gospel. And in, the, in history, what we've noticed is whenever a, a cannibalistic culture got touched by the gospel, its mores changed. And mores being the morals of a culture. And, and we could also note that in any culture where the gospel diminishes its influence, the moral standard and strength of that culture diminishes simultaneously. And, and you're thinking, well, what would be a good example of that? Hmm, how about the nation of the United States of America? 
And, and so as we begin to think of those things, that the church is that. It's, there's something in the gospel, there's something in the Lord that, that is counterculture to the expectations of those without God. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk just a minute about the prayer of the sower. It's not in my notes, but I, I feel led of the Lord to just talk about that and briefly. And, and we know the story of the parable of the sower. The sower went fo- forth to sow. And, and back in those days, you know, they'd kind of throw the seed around. It was what we'd call broadcast spreaders. And, and the seed would just fly out. And if, you, if, you, if you've ever used a broadcast spread or maybe you're planting a lawn or something, you notice, you, you know, I have a little one at home and you turn a crank and it just spits things out. And you notice grass seed falls on the sidewalk and it, it falls, you know, it falls everywhere. And... Um, it's, it's not always precise. And, and Jesus is saying that it's, the, the kingdom of God is like this. A, pair of, a farmer went out and he, he began to sow seed. And, and that seed goes everywhere. And it's not always so precise. And the first thing we realize is that's, that's the Lord's plan. That there's a broadcast of the gospel because the seed is the gospel in the parable. There's a broadcast of this gospel and it it spreads. And then we realize, but it falls on different soil. Now, if you were really careful with your seed, you'd make sure it didn't fall on the sidewalk and it didn't fall among the weeds and it didn't fall here and didn't fall there. But that's that's not how it's designed. And so, you know, it falls on, it falls on hard ground. And, and the hard ground, it doesn't, it doesn't take any root. It springs up quickly, but there's no root system. So the sun comes out and, and heats it up and it burns up and it dies. And, and the, the, some of the seed falls on the pathway and the birds come and steal it. You know, so it falls on the sidewalk and the birds steal it. And, and then some seed falls among the weeds or the thorns, the blackberry vines. We're familiar with those. And, and the, the seed starts to grow, but it gets choked out by the thorns and thistles. And, and then some seed falls on good ground, and it bears an abundance of fruit, 60-fold. And, and then as the Lord talked about that, he said, you know, the, each, each one has a has a Example, there's an analogy. Each one is a metaphor for how the gospel affects different people. And in fact, when I was growing up, I remember uh, the old preachers used to say the same water, the same boiling water that softens a potato hardens an egg, and the same gospel that softens one heart hardens another. And we certainly saw that, you know, in the story of the Exodus, that when when the Lord says, "I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart." And how did the Lord harden Pharaoh's heart? The same way he softened Moses' Moses heart. The Lord showed himself God and it softened Moses' heart, but it hardened Pharaoh's heart. And so we begin to see that and the, and the Lord says, you know, the, when, the, when the seed lands on the path and the birds steal it, it's like Satan immediately takes those truths away from someone. And we've seen that in our culture and history that you can share the gospel before it can even touch a person that the enemy has stolen that from them. And he continues and he says, well, the, the seed that falls on hard ground that gets baked by the sun, it springs up quickly. It's like there are always going to be those people that hear the gospel. They hear the truth of the word of God and they get excited and they spring up quickly. And, and and they go great guns until there's a trial. And and as soon as the trial comes, well, God, look what you've done to me. And and then the the seed that falls among the thorns, those people, they hear the gospel, they give their heart to Jesus, they they get involved in church, but the life gets in the way. And life chokes out the true words of the Lord. And then the, the seed that falls on good ground produces fruit. And what we learn from this passage is that no matter what we come to recognize about the different soils, there's power in the seed. 
And it's an amazing power. And, and we know that, you know, if anyone that's ever dealt with a garden or anything, it's kind of a weird concept. You plant something that looks like a nut, you know, it looks like something off of someone's granola. And you plant it and this bush comes out of it. That's a powerful thing. And of course, the seed doesn't do any good on the shelf. We know that. It has to be planted for it to produce something. But there's power in the seed. And the gospel's like that. There's power in this. And there, you know, we look at it and go, well, Charles, it's just a book. It's just leather and, and paper. But, but what's in there is the communication of the mind of Christ. And there's power in it. And, and you can't, we say, well, we should only plant so seed on good ground. Here's the problem. You don't know what ground's what. You can't do that. You can't say, I'm only going to, I'm only going to share the gospel where I think it's the most effective. Because you don't know. My, my mother uh, was a real mess, to be honest with you, before, certainly before she knew the Lord. And she was raised in, in an atheist home. And she was, not only was she raised by atheists, she was taught that you should never go to church unless someone invites you. So, so they really set her up, one, not to believe in God, and, and two, not to ever try to find him. But for whatever reason, she always believed in him. And she hung around with Christians. And some of her, one of her best friends went to a, a spirit-filled church and was taught Sunday school and all kinds of stuff and never witnessed to her. And, and she, uh, but my mom was a kook and she'd always cut up and make a lot of jokes and didn't seem serious about things and, and so on and so forth. But she, she, you know, her life led her down a really difficult path. And, and uh, you, you have to appreciate some of the things she experienced when she experienced them just weren't done. All right, it was a so she, she ended up with a couple kids that uh, you know she wasn't married and she had a couple kids and uh, there was that and then she married my dad and um, he abandoned her and all those kinds of things. He came back later, but um, she was going through all these things, and here she was, and, and she, uh, she was really into style, and she wore all kinds of makeup, which in some churches wasn't acceptable, and so on and so forth, and, and she would always pray and ask God why he let Jesus die. She didn't know he'd risen from the dead. And all this went on, and one night she was alone, and she heard some music, and she she said it was church music because it sounded spooky. I assume that was organ music, you know. So, uh, but she and she started. She real she felt when she heard it that God was inviting her to church. And in her in her naivete, she just said, "God, I hear you, and I'm coming." Well, she went to the wrong church. Not, well, not. Not really, but she went to a different church than the one playing the music. And it was an Assembly of God church. And she went in there with sleeveless dress and makeup and all this stuff that none of the gals were wearing in the church because it was really strict. And uh, she gave her heart to the Lord Jesus. And... Uh, and it was, it was the whole process when she used to tell the story is kind of a cute process when you think about it. That after she gave her heart to the Lord and, and he'd really touched her, she got up from the altar and, and they said, how do you feel? She says, great, but I can't wait, home, wait to get home and to have a cigarette, which was something else you didn't do in the Assembly of God in the 50s, you know. And, uh, and they loved her through the whole thing. They didn't rebuke her. They didn't beat up on her. But the, the issue is this, when, when she came to the Lord, she contacted her friend who had been a Sunday school teacher at an Assembly of God church and said, why didn't you ever tell me about Jesus? Ten years have gone by from 18 to 28. You never told me about Jesus. She said, well, I just didn't think you'd be interested. See, when you try to choose where the seed goes, 
you're making a really big mistake. When you look at someone and you decide they're not good ground, you're making a really big mistake. And, and we have to begin to think about that. And, and we think, well, that's, that alone is counterculture. We live in a world that says, sow your energy into what works. And, and the Lord's kingdom says, just cast your bread upon the water. And we have to begin to think about this, that we cannot follow the pattern of religion that the world sets for the church because we're not, we're not, that's not our religion. Secularism and worldliness is not our religion. Christianity is our religion. And we have but one author and finish of our faith, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. In this day and age, there's no shortage of theories about what Christianity should be and what a Christian should look like. However, all that matters is what God thinks. All that matters is what God thinks. And, if, and you say, well, Charles, how do you know there's so many different opinions about religion? When you're a pastor, you get to hear them all. You know, like when I'm traveling alone on an airplane, the worst thing, the question anyone can ever ask me is, what do you do for a living? Because then they either won't ever leave me alone, talking about, and, and they'll, have, they'll postulate some of the most ridiculous religious concepts I've ever heard, or they want to change seats immediately. But, you know, and so one of the things I, I might like to tell people, I used to tell them I was flying saucer pilot, but Debbie kept telling them I wasn't. I, that's not true. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, then I thought, well, what I'll tell people is I, I operate a not-for-profit organization. I solicit funds from people on public transportation who ask me what I do for a living. So I haven't ever done that yet either, but it'd be a lot of fun. But you hear these things. Well, I think God is this, and I think God is that. And you begin to realize when you hear everybody saying what, who they think and what they think about God, you realize, wow, they don't know the scriptures. And therein is the problem. Now, I don't mind that in the secular world, but that is an atrocity in the church. And, and the world will try to involve the church in its programs. And largely because they need us more than we need them. But is that what the church is to be involved in? The church exists to serve God, not mankind. We need to learn that. And, and it, it comes down to what Jesus said about the two great commandments. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Mark 2, 12, 30. The second commandment is to love your, love your neighbor as yourself. The world wants to take commandment number two and turn it into commandment number one. And God will not allow it. Because if you violate the greatest commandment, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you have become the greatest sinner because you have broken the greatest commandment. So every time we take the second commandment and make it the first commandment, we become the greatest of sinners. And did you know there is a command that tells us not to worship God like the world around you worships? We're going to read that today. And, and I, I do want to just, you guys seem, you do seem a little quiet. It's kind of like, you know, um, on the westerns, it's quiet out there, too quiet. Uh, but I think I'll live through it. And, and I also realize that, you know, I have to be careful when my mind starts processing something and I start processing it out loud. I, I don't want to um, 
make you uncomfortable with that process. I remember when I was writing some papers for, for a program, uh, Debbie was proofing them for spelling errors, and uh, one day she comes in, and it was just, it wasn't anything. It was just a 10-page paper. And, and she comes in and goes, this thing is giving me a headache. You know, I I just I can only read so much of this. So, and, and then one day we were riding in the car, and, and I said, you know, I was thinking. And she goes, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, you know, I get it that, uh, that I'll start connecting dots that make sense to me, and and so if I do that, just be quiet and pretend like you know what I'm saying. Open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 12. We're going to be reading verses 29 through 32. Uh, and and that, uh, the book of Deuteronomy is an interesting book from my perspective. It's one of the first five books of the Bible. It's called the Pentateuch. Uh, and and it, there, Moses is credited with those books. And he was, he was setting up the children of Israel. And Deuteronomy, what's fascinating about it is it's the second generation. That if you recall, they they escaped Egypt, but the first generation did. They were bound by fear and didn't want to go into the promised land. But their bigger problem was they really just didn't listen to God the first time. He'd speak, and so he said, "Go in the promised land." They didn't. So then, when they got rebuked for it, they decided to go. And the Lord said, "Don't go," and they did anyhow. And they took a beating, and so on and so forth. But part of it was when the Lord told Moses about the first generation of Israelites that escaped Egypt, he said, I'm going to wipe them out and raise up a nation under you. And Moses said, oh, don't do that. And every thought Moses talked him out of it. You don't talk the Lord out of things. Because what happened was that first generation died, except for two men. That first generation died, and God raised up another nation under Moses, 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And they're getting ready to go into the promised land. They were getting ready to receive that thing for which God had brought them out of Egypt. They had been wandering, and God gave them a promise of his land for them. And as they're getting ready to go into what the, would be considered the holy land, Moses begins to tell them everything they need to remember if they're to be fruitful and blessed by God. And that is the book of Deuteronomy. And when, when, whenever you read the book of Deuteronomy, you want to think about that. It's God's advice to Christians about how to go into an unholy land and receive God's protection and blessing all the time. Now, if that sounds like a good idea to you, then follow the book of Deuteronomy. So starting with verse 29, it says, The Lord your God will destroy the nations where you're going and force them out of your way. You will take possession of their land and live there. After they've been after they've been destroyed, be careful you aren't tempted to follow their customs. Don't even ask about their gods and say, how did these people worship their, their gods? We want to do what they did. Never worship the Lord your God in, in the way they worship their gods because everything they do for their gods is disgusting to the Lord. He hates it. They even burn their sons and daughters as sacrifices to their gods. Be sure to do everything I command you. Never add anything to it or take anything away from it. And so we get this idea that when you go into the land, you need to be counterculture. And your worship needs to be counterculture. Now, I'm sure some people have taken that, that sense the wrong direction. You know, there are movements that don't believe in music. They believe in only vocal singing. Um, that's because they apparently haven't read the Bible. You know, and if you're not going to read the whole Bible, maybe you could just read like, I don't know, Psalm 150, the last Psalm, uh, which tells you to worship God with, and it just lists off all these instruments that you should use to worship God with. I think if you read that, you might fix that theology. 
Not to mention all the other places the Bible talks about it. But, so, so we don't want to, I'm not talking about getting overboard here, but we do want to remember we're not letting the world set the pace of the church. And that's a problem. And, and I remember I had a, a he was a psychology. He was our psychology professor in in Bible college. Wonderful man, Don Anderson, and uh, we ended up being very close with them. Uh, we'd been to their house. They'd been to ours. He even came and visited this church in the past and uh, things like that. And uh, he told me in psychology class one time. He told the whole class this. He said, "Whatever the world does, the church will do eventually." And that broke my heart. In fact, I was pretty upset. And, and I, I didn't act out or anything, but he came to me. He says, you, I can tell you look upset by that. And he says, that's good that it upsets you, but you will discover that it's true. And he was 100% correct. And, and he used examples like, you know, like group counseling. Right, which group counseling emerged in the counseling. You know, I have a degree in counseling, but but um, group counseling emerged into the counseling field because you could make more money counseling a group than one person. Which I can, I mean, that's a good idea if you're the counselor, right? I mean, I could I could counsel Debbie for a hundred bucks an hour, or I could counsel Debbie, Sheila, Dave. Right, Les and Jade for 500 bucks an hour. That's how it came about. And then the church decided, hey, that's a good idea. Let's do those kind of programs. So it made its way into the church. And, and you know, about this, I don't want to offend anyone, but I'm going to keep talking anyhow, which will ultimately offend someone. But, you know, in the 90s, there was a big move. If you, if you remember, I don't know if you remember all of it, but in the 90s, there was this big move, and, and they had flag waving in the Olympics as a sport, and they had flag stores, and, and people, all the parades, there were people waving flags, and guess what the church needed for worship then? Flags. At the same time that the rest of the world's doing it. And then they turn them into sacred things. Now, I don't have a problem with worshiping the Lord with a flag. But maybe you're just doing it because you like it. See, I knew I was going to upset someone today because that's what I do. And, and I was visiting a church when I was a superintendent uh, and I was going through the building and they were asking about a floor and it was a, it was a floating floor. They had a floating floor over concrete, which didn't make sense because they could have just tiled the concrete. And I'm like, why do you have this weird floating floor? Because it affected the Sunday school. It was because we used to have Christian aerobics, right? And then I committed a faux pas and said it out loud instead of my head. I said, oh, oh church Pharisees in their synagogues. You couldn't, you, you guys couldn't just go to an aerobics class and witness to people. You had to build a floor in this fellowship hall for that. Because whatever the world does, the church thinks it should do. And that's not the answer. The answer is to do what God does. And we see that the application of this passage relates to our faith being influenced by the culture around us. And is our faith being influenced by the culture around us? And, and we know that Christianity has been influenced by the culture around it. And things have made their way into the kingdom of God that never belonged in the kingdom of God because the church gave precedence to the world. 
And, and he, you know, the Lord says, never worship the Lord your God in the way they worship their gods. The world has a lot of gods. Now, I will admit, I am not a sports fan. Like, I, I don't care if you get a home run in football or score a goal in baseball. Right? I, I, don't, I don't even know why it's called a bowl, but I've never seen one. Well, I've seen a bowl, but I've never seen a Super Bowl in my life. Um, and, and I'm hoping to make that a lifelong achievement, but um, I don't, that's not me. It's just not me. And even when I played some of those sports, I didn't watch them. I mean, I watched what was going on around me, but you know what I mean. It's just not me. But, I, but you know there are churches that would have Super Bowl parties in the church, I imagine those, some of those commercials made it a little difficult for the church, I would hope. I, I had no problem with Super Bowl. People go home and watch Super Bowl. As, long, as, as I understand it, it starts well enough after church that you can go home and watch it. I just don't know why the church needs to host it because it's not about the gospel. You say, well, why is that a big deal? Because I'll tell you something. Everything the church gets involved in to great extent that's not about the gospel makes the church, it dilutes the power of the church when it comes to the gospel. That the more things we can be distracted by from the gospel, the less we are about the gospel. Now, I'm not talking about individuals at this point. I'm talking about as a corporate body of believers. The more the church can obsess with the concerns of the world instead of the concerns of God, the less it is the church. Now, how many know this description of the church? It's the bride of Christ. You ever heard that? Now, how many husbands here want their brides to go take care of everybody else instead of their home? At what point does that become critical? At what point, well, well, there's no dinner for the children and I can't, and the laundry, there's no laundry in the, and, and we can't cook and I'm not there for you and I don't have time for you because I'm taking care of six other families instead of my own. We'd go, well, that's not any kind of relationship. We are the bride of Christ. And, and, and you, when, when Adam and Eve uh, fell and, and sinned, they, they, they altered the balance of creation. Because God had given dominion to mankind. Here I go again, right? But follow me. God had given dominion to mankind to rule over the animals. And when... When Eve yielded to the serpent, mankind submitted to the animals and gave them rule. And that wasn't God's plan. And when Eve went to Adam, Adam's responsibility, because he was the high priest of his home, was to say, we need to go straight to God and tell him what you did, and I'll stand with you. It was not to partake of the same sin. Adam failed to be redemptive. As he submitted to her instead of saying, let's go to God with this. And so when the Lord comes to them and he begins to, to make proclamation over them, right? You, he tells the serpent, you're going to crawl on your belly and, and Eve, you're gonna, it's going to hurt when you have babies. And, and Adam, you're going you're gonna to sweat to earn your livelihood, all those kinds of things. He's reordering things the way they need to be. And he makes a statement to Eve. Now, this isn't about your marital bliss right now. This is about the kingdom of God and the gospel. Pay attention. He says to Eve, your desire shall be for your husband. That's a command to the, to the bride of Christ also. That the word of God to the bride of Christ is 
church, your desire should be towards your husband, your groom, the Lord Jesus Christ. And whenever the church gets obsessed with the culture around it instead of the culture of the kingdom, its desire is no longer towards its husband. And God wants to heal that. And because when we do things the world's way, God finds it offensive. And, and there have been examples of that throughout the history of the church. And, and we have a biblical example because we're in church and we need to have a biblical example. But there is one. And it's 2 Kings chapter 16. You can look at that. I'm just going to tell you the story. But you can read about it and check me out there. 2 Kings chapter 16. It's about King Ahaz. And Ahaz decides to visit another king, the king of Assyria. His name is Tiglath-Pileser. He's pretty well known in history. And, and Ahaz goes and visits Tiglath-Pileser. He goes to Damascus and visits him there. He's the king of Assyria. And he sees the altar that they use to, to worship their pagan gods. And according to 2 Kings chapter 16, Ahaz comes back and he says, he tells Uriah, he says, you will make an altar like this. And they, they make a copy of the pagan altar. And then, and then he removes the altar of the Lord from the temple and says, I'll decide what I'm going to do with the Lord's altar. And we, from now on, all sacrifices will be made on this new altar. And he allows the pagan influence to alter the worship of the Israelites in the temple of the Lord. And in that process, he does some other things, right? He also removes and alters other temple furnishings. He cuts the legs off of a table. He does all kinds of stuff. And, and he's identified, if you read about him in Second Chronicles 28, as, you know, it always says, and this king was good and this king was bad. Guess which one he was. It says that, that he, um, he was not a good king and that he practiced paganism and that later he cut up all the vessels of God's house and shut the doors to God's house. Now see, when he first brought that altar back home to put in the temple, he thought he was going to inspire the people to worship the Lord more. But it led him to a path where he finally closed the doors on God's temple. And what happens in, the, in, in, in Christianity is that people are putting less faith in the power of the gospel seed and more faith in the gimmicks of humanity. And they think if we try this and we try that and we do this and we do that, more people will come to our church and they think they're inspiring people to worship the Lord more. But what they're doing is they're getting themselves onto a path where they eventually shut the doors to God's temple because they're worshiping according to the culture instead of the kingdom. And it's always about the gospel and the church. Always. Always. It's never about anything but the word of God in the church. Because that is the intent of the Almighty. And, and later in history we find this. Uh, we, we, you've heard of the, Renaissance, your, the European Renaissance that occurs in the um, 15th century, the 1400s. It started a little earlier, but roughly in the, in the 15th century, there's the European Renaissance, okay? And during the European Renaissance, a uh, philosophy emerges, which is really something adapted that they had heard on, you know, because there was an influx on the Silk Road from the East, and by long before that, a guy named Confucius had come up with this belief system that ultimately led to the humanism of Renaissance of the Renaissance. And in, in the Renaissance, they begin to believe in what was called humanism. And they, the goal was to become a perfect humanista. And that was their word, right? That you want to be the perfect humanista. The perfect humanista was educated and cultured and physically fit. Hmm. 
That's what everyone, you know, right? You, if, you, if you can't be smart, you should pretend to be smart. And everybody wants to be physically fit and they want to have all this stuff and, and so on and so forth. Because once you attained enough intellect and you attained enough culture and you attained enough power, you were the perfect human being. You were the perfect humanista. You were all that man should be. And that has, and, and, and that begin to take place in the renaissance and and it's what emerged in the church simultaneously was religious humanism and you know you'd have to be into historical theology to appreciate that but what emerges in that same period is 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 religious humanism and, and that's the first time i, I I'm going to upset an apple cart for some people, but not probably people in our church, but uh, the first time in the church history that it began to talk about having a free will was when they embraced religious humanism in the church. And, and that's an interesting thing because if you study out the, the salvation process and all the, the issues of will, right, in 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 the scriptures from the original language here's what you discover every time it talks about that stuff you know whose will it talks about God's God's everything we read from scripture God's will mattered more than man's will but once once the church began to embrace religious humanism man's will became more important than God's will and that was a problem and it led to this other great event in, her, in church history known as the Reformation. When, it, when a pastor in Wittenberg, Germany, uh, made up a 95 theses that he thought were wrong with the church, and he, was, he put them on the door only to show this is what we're going to talk about. He wasn't trying to start a, a revolution. He was just trying to fix his church, and it exploded because God wanted it to. And one of his greatest works, by his own opinion, and certainly by many other opinions, was, was, is in English, it's called On Bondage of the Will. The Latin translation is The Unfree Will. was a long argument with a man named Ameris, who happened to be a religious humanist in the church. And he and Martin Luther began to argue with him about this issue. Because Ameris had embraced all the culture of the Renaissance. And none of the gospel of God. And it led to the divide because God's preserving his church. Because you know what Jesus said, I will, on this rock, forget about who the rock is, on this rock, I will build my church. Whose church is it? The Lord's. Who builds it? The Lord. And, and so we begin to see that. Now there are movements even today. And I'm aware of them. I could, I could, tell you the names of them I could show you the documentation or anything you want to see I'm not going to today but there are movements to this day that look into new ageism which is an updated form of Hinduism for things to add to their churches and you've probably read their books and sang their songs and been to some of their seminars And the Lord says it's disgusting to worship the way the world worships. And we go, well, just don't go overboard. And, you know, and instantly, in the history of, of my experience as a pastor, I've preached sermons that are confrontational. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. And, and in that process, people will get, have this experience we call Conviction. And they'll go to someone they know in the church and they'll tell them, I'm, I was really convicted. And the person will talk them out of being convicted. And I'm going to tell you something. If you do that, the Lord will hold you accountable and it will haunt your life. If I lay out the truth of God's word and someone is convicted and you talk them out of conviction, you are fighting the Holy Spirit, not me. And you will deal with the Holy Spirit, not me. And we don't want to do that. This isn't meant as a condemnation. It's meant as a serious warning to the body of Christ. 
you, you have, what, you, what you, a lot of people don't realize is most, if, if, if it was up to me, I think probably more people go to heaven than will go to heaven. Because I'm, I'm more easy going about stuff like that than you realize. But it's not up to me. Uh, you know, I'm a very, you know, people say, well, you're pretty conservative. There's, I'm conservative about some, one thing in my life, one thing only in my life, and I'm very conservative about it, and it's the Word of God. And the Word of God makes me morally conservative. Period. If I didn't believe there was a God and I didn't know Jesus Christ, I would be a liberal because there'd be no point to being anything else if I didn't believe in God. So when I tell you stuff, I'm not talking about condemnation. I'm talking about warning. That, that you, we allow the world to influence us for hours and hours and hours throughout the week. And we allow God to influence us for minutes. And we wonder what's wrong. And, and the point to be made is not is that not all that happens in Christendom is Christian. Not all Israel did that. Not everything Israel did was the worship of the Lord. Not all that happens in churches is guided by Scripture. And you won't know if you don't read it. Not every worship chorus is biblically true. Uh oh. I, I was talking about that one time because, you know, I am a theologian. I was talking with another theologian about the fact that if we had any brains, we'd evaluate all of our worship songs theologically. He says, but people don't want to do that. And I, my answer is this. I don't care what people want to do. It's not worship if God disagrees with it. But we go around singing then we memorize a song that's false theology and we go around singing it. And if anyone says, well, that's not biblically true, we get mad at them. That's like King Ahab, the only good prophet they had, he kept in jail. We can't let our culture determine what the church is doing or should be doing. Our nation is caught up in a multitude of culture wars right now. Have you noticed that? And the truth is, if people followed scripture, we wouldn't be having those culture wars. So, you know, the, our nation's caught up in a, in, a, in a culture war over racial diversity. Now, I look around our congregation, I see a diverse congregation. Of course, when I look around at home, I see a diverse congregation. But that's not, that's not what the world's doing with that. That's not about the gospel. The word makes it really clear. There's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, old or young. And there's, there's no slave or free. In other words, there's no elite. There's no class system. There's no racism. There's no gender issue. There's no ageism. None of that exists in God's kingdom. It's real simple. That's the gospel. That has nothing to do with what's going on in the world right now. Nothing. The world is in bondage to fear, but the, the Lord has not given the church the spirit of fear but of love, power, and a sound mind. The world is in bondage politically, but the church has a king. The world is, is gone nuts with things. I, don't, I do not like to follow the news. I'm forced to because someone in my house, among the many people in my house, it's either Debbie or I that does this, and it's not me, but uh, reads the news out loud to me. 
and then reads comments about the news out loud to me. And she's a gunslinging Republican and I'm a non-affiliate. I don't care. She does it. I love her anyhow. Not when she's doing that, but I get over it and start loving her again as soon as she stops. But if I've learned anything, I, she'll read things, and, and I will admit, I actually occasionally listen to it because it's, it's like sin that way, but um, it sucks you in. And, and I'll hear things, I'm like, never in my wildest dreams would I have thought you, the human race in the United States of America would become that crazy. The national standard for people of men, with mental illness in the United States of America has, has, has kind of circumferenced the, the figure of 25% for a long time. It'll be 21, 22, 23, 24, 26, 25. So it's always about that. I'm beginning to think it might be going up. And you know what? That's got nothing to do with the church. Because God has given us a spirit of sound mindedness. And if you want to if you want to fall into that, it will it will plague you. It will plague you. But unfortunately, there are Christian movements that can that get so caught up in the culture wars of our society, they're not preaching the gospel anymore. They're so busy preaching the concerns of the capital and the governor's office that they forget to preach the word of God. And Paul warns of this, and, and so we're wrapping this up, but Paul warns about this to the Corinthian church. Now, the Corinthian church, there's two letters written to the church in Corinth that we have in scripture uh, we think there's another one out there but God didn't let us have it so that's fine but what we know about the Corinthian church is if you want a really bad example of a church that's the one they will go down in infamy as the worst possible example of a church they were divisive they were immoral they looked crazy when you went there. Now, if you've ever read 1 Corinthians, you know I'm telling you the truth. I, don't, I will never understand why we as Pentecostals will try to model ourselves after the Corinthian church because the patients were running the asylum in that church. They clearly were. And Paul rebukes them for it. And in fact, I... One day, I was, I was doing this for a dissertation I was writing, but one day I read the book of 1 Corinthians, the second day I read 2 Corinthians, and, and I made a note of every sin that Paul corrected that was happening in the church. And I had, without overlapping them, I just, if, I, if it was a repeat, I didn't write it down, there were 78 